And well, at this point, we'll um, go back to item E1, because I think uh, hi, our presenter from Nikolai Consulting is here. Would you please join us? Hi, can introduce you. Uh, this is Gary Klein. Gary is with Nikolai Consulting. Nikolai has been doing this study for us. Uh, I believe this is the third round of this particular study. It was a gentleman named Doug Kokarud uh, before him for the first two rounds, who has since forward, uh, who has since forth retired. One of the interesting things about this study is from the time of the last study to the time of this study, um, Gatsby, the um, the uh, Government Accounting Standards Board has updated how some of these things need to be reported and recorded with our balance sheet. So this one is actually uh, <coughs> relatively transitional because what was GASB 45 prior has now moved into GASB 75. Um, other than that, I'm going to uh, ask Mr. Klein to uh, kindly take over. Okay, my name is Gary Klein. I've, uh, I'm an actuary, uh, Social Society of Actuaries, and uh, Fellow of the Conference of Consulting Actuaries. I've been working on retiree medical and pension plans for um, close to 30 years. Um, and I worked with uh, three large global firms before joining Nicolay Consulting. And I, uh, in terms of your retirement plan, the retiree medical plan, that I work on. Uh, this is a benefit plan through the CalPER system, and they provide uh, access to uh, various insurance plans, for, such as Kaiser, First Choice, First Care, uh, to your active and retired employees. And so, what I am, my role is to determine the accounting liability associated with uh, that plan and the accounting liability, there's two, there's really two liabilities of concern. There is the accounting liability which you show everybody and on your balance sheet as an expense and that is governed by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, GASB. Then there's the liability associated with um, what you would pre-fund if you were to have a, a certain amount of money set aside right now to cover the benefits you promised. And that's pre-funding. I mean, the uh, Marin Community Service District created a trust fund and deposited $60,000 in it as an initial deposit towards pre-funding. And so now uh, in prior to the new uh, the new GASB 75 rules, GASB 45 was both an accounting method and a funding method. What I mean by that is that the annual cost that 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 uh, standard was having you charge as an expense could have also been a dollar amount that you put into a trust and prefunded that plan uh, on a on an actually reasonable way to get to full funding over a period of 20, 30 years. Um, but you, the Marine Wood was not, GASB 45 came out in 2006 or so, and um, prior to that, you were using the cash basis of accounting for this plan, where you were not pre-funding it, you weren't even recognizing the future costs over employees' careers. So it was not even there until the people were gone. So uh, you couldn't really align the benefits that you were giving the cost to the value that the employees were giving the benefit to the community service district. So um, accrual accounting, GASB 45, did that, but didn't put the liability on the balance sheet had you accrued, amortized that liability over 30 years, um, GASB 75 changed all that and put the liability right on your balance sheet. So right now, as of today, on page this report on page, um, page one, shows uh, several breakdowns of the liabilities and it shows two things. One called the present value of future benefits, one's the actual accrued liability. 
the actual accrued liability is the value of all your promises that you've given to date to retirees and current active employees. Um, if an active employee dies in service, God forbid, their liability for retirement goes away. So the active liability, this liability doesn't really exist until they, it, it's an assumption that they're going, these benefit payments are going to be made in the future. Um, and so we, uh, th these present values take into account probabilities of studies that were performed by CalPERS on mortality, withdrawal, retirement, um, and it uh, takes, um, and it gives you an assessment of what your promises are. So the liability of 6.4 million um, is, uh, is the liability as of June 30, 17. Me measures on uh, for accounting purposes are actually a uh, year behind your fiscal year end and um, the that is split between 2.8 million or so is for retirees and 3.6 million or so is for active employees the number set of numbers above that is looking at a closed group of a population, your 19 or so actives and 14 retirees, what is the liability if they continue services and then all of them retire and then eventually collect all their benefits? For just that closed group, it's 9.2 million. And you can see the retiree liability is the same because they've already earned all their benefits. It's just in a drawdown phase for them. But for active employees, uh, they're uh, they're evenly distributed um, from between, you have about seven out of the, uh, I'm sorry, it was, uh, the distribution is on page 10. You have about nine, 11 that are under the age 40 um, and out of 19 and the rest are over age 40. Um, they're that, group has a ways to go to get to the age 50 and 5 eligibility for retiree medical benefits. So um, you have about half your liability accrued to date by your population. It's sort of evenly distributed across the spectrum. So on average, you, they've earned half their benefits They're halfway through their careers as a group on average. Um, so you would imagine that their liability is halfway accrued. So that uh, one of the things about pre-funding is that if you set assets aside as benefits are accrued, then people, services, are paying for their own benefits when they retire. So it's a good idea to pre-fund. Um, on this page, I show that there were no assets, which there weren't at 6.30.17. And, um, so this said that I showed a dollar amount on this summary. It's an executive summary, so it doesn't show a lot of the details behind what, where, the, what, where these numbers came from, but I provide that later on in the report. Uh, the next number is about 531000 That's about a half a million dollars. That's how much you would have to set inside into a trust over a period of between 20 and 25 years to fully fund this plan. And um, if, you, if you look at what the contribution we expected to occur between 17 and 18, I expected it was known by the time I did this report, was 60,000. This 60,000 is not a dollar amount that is in your budget per se, so you do not have plans currently to fund it 60,000 every year this was, uh, this was a, a uh, how would you uh, call it, Ex excess uh, assets that became available to put in a trust, so you did. And we'll talk about the value of that a little bit later. Um, but moving on, the uh, estimated annual retiree premium is about 140000 that you're paying. And uh, the... Active implicit subsidy is about 47,000. 
for total, the, all of those, the premiums, when you pay them off, on a, they call it a pay-go basis. Um, that's essentially a contribution in accounting terms. And so it could count towards this $530,000 contribution to a trust that I was talking about. And so could the 60000 and this implicit subsidy, um, suffice it to say that actives and retirees' claims at CalPERS, pre-Medicare retirees, are all merged together and a single premium is calculated. <coughs> it's a flat premium charged to everyone, whether you're an active or a pre-Medicare retiree. But we know that retirees have higher claims than actives do. So actives are subsidizing retirees. And we calculate how much that is for the community service district and it's to the tune of $47,000. One way to look at it is that if you left the CalPERS program, went and bought insurance on your own, and you had the buying power of two million members that CalPERS did, which you don't, but if you had that kind of leverage against insurance companies and got their rates, then your active premiums would drop by $47,000, but your retiree premiums would go up. And so um, it's, it's an advantage to stay in the plan. CalPERS is employee retiree friendly organization. Um, and they, by law, set it so that, have it so that claims for pre-Medicare retirees and active employees must be blended together as a way to make retiree medical costs more affordable uh, to them. So that's, that's what the whole implicit subsidy is about. The accountants, GASB, the, the reporting I do here is all about making transparent um, the financing that's going on with the plan or the where the numbers are coming from. So that's why they had me calculate that number. And on, I'm going to uh, first skip page two and go straight to three. This is a projection of the benefit payment. So you can see that the implicit subsidy is, uh, is projected going forward to stay about the same level. Premiums, on the other hand, are expected to climb because people would retire uh, they, they're they about 190000 they climbed to in 10 years about 317000 assuming that my estimates of health care trend are accurate. Uh, the health care trend is anywhere from around 7% and 9% for drugs starting in the first year. Uh, 7% for pre-Medicare medical uh, and 4 or 5% for post-Medicare premiums, grading down over time to an ultimate rate of about 4.5% over 10 years or so. Um, this, this assumption of health trend is important because there is very difficult to predict what health care costs are increasing. Um, it seems like there is uh, no control over that. Um, it, is, uh, it is actually a symptom of our, uh, our, entire, our system wide when they took out of the insurance commissioners of the states the ability to price control. Like Medicare is price control and that's why um, Bernie Sanders group is asking for Medicare for all. It's the same as the Affordable Care Act that Obama was going to put in, but the Republicans said in order to get it passed, you have to take price control out. So um, if we had price controls in, then uh, the, the costs would be stabilized. They are not stable right now. So and insurance commissioners can't really um, prevent increases because the level of um, uh, the level of uh, evidence that you have to provide in order to get your drugs increased to a high, uh, prices higher or is it just your costs as an organization are going up 
but um, we've seen abuses of that system. But in any event, long story short, uh, this this the costs in this plan are sensitive to trend, and this projection of your premiums is based on an uh, estimate of trend that is. Uh, Pre-65 starts at about 7%, post-65, 5% 5 grading down. The whole grading down concept is um, based on the assumption that it's actually an industry-wide thing. Um, when I say industry-wide, actuarial industry-wide, the belief is that cost, healthcare costs can't continue to increase because the um, it would consume the entire gross domestic product of the country and we can't spend all our money on medical costs. In reality, you lose access to coverage. More and more people are losing access to coverage every day. That's why they wanted to put the individual mandate in Affordable Care Act. And so with the um, declining population that have access to it, the costs can continue to rise higher than I'm estimating in this report. So the actual liabilities could be higher due to trend increases higher than I'm assuming. But if I if I uh, had say a level seven percent increases just add on ad infinitum, increase your liabilities uh, significantly more, then your auditors would say, why are you out of step with everyone else in the country? And so I I am handcuffed by this. Of course, we could have price controls come back. So, uh, but I am saying my my job here is to tell you about risks associated with this plan. The one I I have very trouble measuring is healthcare cost increases. Um, on page six, it shows you the sensitivity of your your unfunded liability, but it's basically your liability, because at this point you had no assets at June 30, 17, to changes in the discount rate or changes in the healthcare trend rate. So the discount rate is currently 3.58% at 63017. That is pretty much government 20-year bonds, the general obligation bond. So uh, it's fairly risk-free. And a good measure, if Goldman Sachs came in here today and said, what is your cash flow? What discount rate should you use? They might get a little more conservative, like 2.58% because they're a little more risk averse. Uh, and so your liability instead of 6.4 million might be 7.5 million. What that mean, means is that you have to set another million aside in a trust and get that much less return over time to fully fund this plan today and not have to pay another penny for it, uh, for at least the benefits accrued to date. It's the same thing with the trend rate. If the trend rate had a 1% higher trend than I'm predicting in this report, it adds another million to your liability. Um, and on a $6 million liability, adding another million is 15, 16%. It's just big number. These are big numbers big risks associated with this plan. Um, but that is, uh, uh, I have actually have more to report a little bit on the funding side of it. Um, and this one, I, because I know that uh, sustainability of promises is important. And so I was trying to push back on, Eric, can you commit to $60,000 going into a fund? Um, annually, put it in your budget. And so what, there's an opportunity within the GASB rules that if you do that, then um, the liability you put on your balance sheet is going to be lower, a lot lower. Um, the, the asset, the $60,000 you set aside is put in a CalPERS trust. CalPERS uh, is managing that money at super low uh, fees. Investment fees, manager fees are usually the most expensive. You can get 50, 70 basis points easy. And then there's administrative fees. In CalPERS aggregate, everything is 10 basis points. And you've got 
the power of the CalPERS investment team behind that trust as well. So it's it's a really great deal um, as far as that. I'm, I guess I'm not sounding like an advocate to it, but um, the idea about setting money aside for this is um, really about uh, there, there's uh, the sustainability of benefits and levelizing your cash flows. Um, as I explained before, your benefit payments are going to be increasing from uh, $100,000. They're going to keep going up. Um, and this, my, the projections that I have don't include new employees coming in board. So over, you know, if you did an open group projection, they call it, where I added new employees, you'd, you'd get this state of benefit payments, cash flow coming out of this organization that is much higher. But if you get assets in a trust, you can earn returns to help pay for that. So the 60000 set aside in a trust, you're still doing PAYGO, paying benefit payments from your annual revenues, but setting additional money aside and reserving it for uh, when costs get higher, more and more people retire and it will uh, protect your budget. And so that I actually show some, uh, and also, so this, just to take a step back, the liabilities I'm saying, the six million, the, uh, or if you used a, high, a slightly lower discount rate, you can add a million. If you, if you use a higher discount rate, you can subtract a million because it's like it's thinking, oh, you're going to get investment returns if you got 4% or 4.5% instead of 3.5%. So what, what if you invested it, it in equities? Would you only get 4%, 4.5%? Right now, where the markets are, um, there's a belief that, I don't know if you're aware of the Buffett Index, it's the market capitalization of the S&P 500 divided by GDP. And it's at an all-time high. In his mind, it's going to come down. So stocks are going to come down. That's when he didn't know. But this is one of his many measures. Um, so that's the belief. OK, I hear that. I understand. I don't necessarily want to put money in the trust. But when they do go down by 20%, those with, like CalPERS, with hundreds of billions of dollars in a trust, Money. You have 60000 if it goes down by 20%, you, get, you lost 12000 But it recovers. It's always what recovers. So timing the market isn't that important. When you're a real young plan, what's important is getting on a schedule of contributing annually $60,000 every year. It builds up quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, the long-term investment returns, CalPERS is you invested in a, in a strategy that is expected to earn between 6 and 7%. And so that would cut your liability way back. I showed the, I do projections of the liabilities. There's on page 8 is a projection of the liability over three years and a calculation of the contribution. It's 6.46 million growing to 6.9 million in three years. On page 10, it's the same thing, except I'm using the 6.73 discount rate or long-term investment return that CalPERS expects with the investment strategy you're using. And so that brings the liability down from 6.4 million in 2017-18 to 4.18 million, 4.2 million. Um, the contribution that you would be required to set inside a trust is all of a sudden decreased to 390,000 from 545. What Gatsby does is it says, look, if you come up with a funding policy, regardless of this contribution I'm calculating right here, because I continued the Gatsby 45 methodology, which if you recall, was both an accounting and a funding method. So the annual expense, this is what you would have been expensing except on the prior page, the 3.58%. Uh, you would have been expensing about 545000 a year uh, for this on accounting dollars. Mm -hmm. um, it, with 
uh, now that also could have been considered a contribution to a trust, if you recall. Um, that's really amortizing liabilities over 20 years. Uh, if you have, and, and what Gatsby 75 says is, I'll let you use a higher discount rate if you put money aside in a trust, and even the PAYGO will get the higher discount rate, um, and will, if, if all of your payments are going to be fully paid off in, in a reasonable actual funding method, according to the white paper on public pension plans, is no more than 30 years. Less is better, but stop at 30 years. It gets much more risky after that. Your contributions of, or a funding policy of $60,000 a year plus PAYGO would end before 30 years. So you would actually achieve having fully paid all benefits in the plan or if you just put in $60,000 a year which got you the maximum discount rate of 6.73. You get to put that on your on your balance sheet, and it looks like you have a lower liability. It's a riskier liability. You now have to get 6.73 percent return. You took a couple million off that was on there before. That's expected returns your banking and saying, okay, I only owe 4.1 million, and if I set it aside right now but um, instead of six million right now. Wouldn't it be safer to put six million aside right now and put it in safe investments that you know are gonna get 4% or 3.58%? Um, so yes, um, it, GASB is allowing, and, and the corporations uh, and, and FASB, financial accounting standards, they don't allow this. They don't allow you to reflect on your books a discount rate of 6.73%. They don't allow you to take, put all this risk on the balance sheet. They want you to value your cash flows with a risk-free rate of discount rate. Um, but one of the reasons that governments can get to do it, you have the power to tax, you have um, ability to uh, you're, you're not really subject to being bought and sold liquidated. Um, although bankruptcies can occur, uh, that's not really being bought and sold. And so you have more staying power and so they believe that it's justified that you won't need to ever be, have all your risks, all your liabilities converted and sold to somebody else at a risk-free rate of return because that's what would happen if you went out and you bought insurance policy to cover this. Um, pay and took, gave, you, had to, you have to give six million dollars to an insurance company and say, now you go pay their medical benefits. They probably asked for more because of what I told you about trend. They probably asked for seven or eight or nine million. Um, but uh, that said, uh, the, th this is really the sum total of this report. Um, I do an assessment for you every year. I can I. It's based on new census data every two years. Um, so the census, as long as your population doesn't change too much, which the accountants say is about 10 per, 5 to 10 percent, you should think about doing a full valuation in the interim year. But um, in any event, I, so um, this, this uh, would, this really doesn't incorporate new demographics or anything except every two years. So. Um, if you wanted to look at this again, um, maybe not doing it annually is required, or I don't know what you were doing in the past. I'm actually new, as Eric had uh, said. I uh, joined Nicolay about three years ago. So questions? Thank you, Gary, so much. Um, it's, it takes, it's, it's challenging to make an actual presentation sound exciting and comprehensible <laughs> to all. So just to make sure that we're on the same page. Uh, page one, um, the $9 million, that's 19 employees with all future benefits. The 6.5 is 19, 19 um, employees with various actuarial adjustments. Uh, the half a million right below, that's what we would have to pay annually to fully fund the obligation of 6.5 million as listed above. 
the three and a half percent, that's the discount rate that we have to use right now, unless we commit to 60,000 annually uh, right. funding, at which point we could be bound to 6.78. Uh, 6.73, right. Three. So the, the so the five hundred thousand it assumes you're only going to get three point five percent eight percent return on your asset. Mm -hmm. So you have less investment earnings. Um, if it was six point seven three percent that you're actually going to get on your assets, it would be, it'd be lower, and that that number is reported on on, on another page yeah. because your official funding policy as of today is to contribute sixty thousand and then an unknown unbudgeted amount. Thank you. After. Okay. Yep. I don't know. No, I, I get it. Yep. Okay. To, to Mr. Clyde's point, because of the, looking at the valuation data, this we knew that sixty thousand was done. Looking at the report completion date, we knew that it was not only budgeted but actually deposited. If you look at this current fiscal year, where we have uh, budgeted a hundred thousand and are making those deposits, that would obviously change these numbers in a positive manner as well. Um, but to his point, since we don't have a policy that says a minimum of X amount, we have a policy that says the contribution amount will be determined as a, uh, through the budget creation process, uh, uh, if any uh, contribution whatsoever at that time, he can't spread this out, but luckily, not luckily, but he did include some of these calculations within here at the 60, as well as, hey, if you did 60 every year, this is what that would equate to, uh, but you're not able to do the 100 because at the point of time we did this, that wasn't, uh, right. that's Question. just looking yeah. too far forward yeah. for the purposes of this yeah. report. Um, to answer your question, Gary, we do this. We were doing this every three years now with GASB 75. You have to do it every two for the full valuation, plus the other big difference uh, between 45 and 75, it's much like when GASB 68 was done, we have to do annual, I, I would guess I lack of a better term, I'll call them kind of micro updates uh, and valuations that get submitted to our auditor as part of the audit for our, uh, for our books. That never had to be done. He could use that same report for three years. Uh, and now there is a uh, evaluation update that goes into uh, in the web books as part of our audit. So every two years we have to go every two years a big one and, and every year um, a micro update. Okay. For lack of a better term. And um, the board could consider the policy to commit. Um, obviously it has implications mm -hmm. on on other um, responsibilities. You change the policy down the line as well. Right. Mm -hmm. er, you have questions? No. no? Um, so the board has said it's open into the public. Yes, I would classify anything from CalPERS as fake news. In the longest bull market in history, CalPERS hasn't been able to make the promised return for years. And they only, in the last year or so, started lowering it, I believe from 7.5% to 7 and a quarter. And then to say, it's still fake news. You can't believe a thing that CalPERS says if you have to rely on their numbers of what their return, good luck, because it, it isn't happening. And this is a big reason that I think the average taxpayer just throws up their hands and saying, you know, you people don't know what the hell you're doing. You're relying on fake figures or projections that, that don't happen. I can remember when Genevieve Bolding was the business manager of this district, I was at the meeting where she said, we can raise the retirement for the firefighters from 2.5% at 30 to 3% at 30, and it won't cost the district a penny because for a very few years, CalPERS was doing well. And Marinwood has lived to regret that decision of jumping from two and a half to three percent. That's why, uh, personally, I have I have no confidence in anything Calpers promises because they just don't seem to be smart enough 
to try and even be equal with the market, let alone surpass the market. I couldn't agree with you more. Meanwhile, uh, returns of seven and a half or one quarter are uh, possible out there in the market, but apparently not to CalPERS. But um, I think what you are pointing to is that with every decision we make, we really have to study lo the long-term implications of um, of those actions, you know, whether it's um, you know raises or changes in investment strategies, whatever you may have. Under the basic the basic tax structure that this district is set up on, it's not fisc fisc uh, fiscally viable in the long term. It just isn't because of these pension, unfunded pension things, let alone the, uh, the health insurance for retirees. You throw that into the regular uh, pension deficit. And there's nothing but red ink as far as the eye can see. I think many agencies are looking at similar circumstances and they have the power to, to um, tax, you know, bring in sales revenues, which we cannot. So I understand what you're saying. Well, you saw what happened with the lax tax increase. It passed by, what, seven or eight votes? And I think hell will freeze over before you get uh, an increase uh, again in property tax. Thank you. Anyone else would like to comment on this exciting actuarial study? <clears throat> so uh, PERS, uh, $340 billion, I think that's a pretty significant amount of money that they invest. Um, I don't think that all their um, facts are exactly accurate, but I wouldn't consider it fake news. Uh, also, I know that CalPERS works very hard for the employer in representing them and, and going through the actuarials. Um, have they made mistakes in the past? Yes. Did we all know that the recession was going to hit us like it did? Um, maybe Mr. Marinoff did, but I did not, nor did anybody else. So um, what might be fake news to some of us isn't necessarily to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. I believe in cycles. Anybody else would like to comment? No. Thank you so much, Gary. My pleasure.